What's it say? Yay. I told you! Ha 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 ha! Word problems, yay! That's right! Now, there's no way in the world I can give you an example of every type of word problem. I can't do it. It's impossible. Uh, I can't give you one method that's going to work for every word problem. I can't do that either. It's really going to take a whole lot of practice for you to get super good at this. What I'm going to do for you right now is give you an outline of ideas that work very well in order in which you think about things that's going to make you more successful in doing word problems. So, the first thing, it sounds so silly, but the first thing you want to do in a word problem, number one, read it carefully. Read it carefully and don't try to solve it right off the bat. All right, that, that's a mistake. Read it carefully. Number two, if you can, draw a picture. If applicable, draw a picture of it. Number three, usually it's one or the other with these two. It's usually either you draw a picture or this next one, sometimes both. Uh, number three is if you can, find a formula. Sometimes these word problems, they give you a formula that makes it nice. If not, they'll give you something that you can find a formula for. Number four. This is kind of an important one. All right. Number four is make what's called a verbal model. What a verbal model is, is kind of a combination of a sentence and a math expression. It uses symbols like plus and minus, but it doesn't put any variables in there yet. It doesn't try to solve the problem yet. A verbal model just kind of organizes the thoughts of what's happening in the problem. And I'll give you a couple examples on how you would do that. Uh, but this is this is important. Make a verbal model. Like an equation, but with words. Like an equation, but with words. Number five, after you have that verbal model, it makes it really easy to fill out variables. So from the verbal model, put in your variables. So we're going to fill out the verbal model with variables, uh, but here's the key. Whatever problem you're in, in this class right now, you must use one variable. You cannot do X's and Y's and Z's in every variable, a different variable for every situation. You can't do that. So with one problem, we're going to have how many variables? One. Now all these problems are going to relate uh, like different quantities back to that variable. So for instance, uh, if I say Susie drives five miles an hour faster than Johnny, well, Johnny's speed would be x and Susie's would be x plus five. You have to relate it back. You can't say Susie's y and Johnny's x because you have only one equation for this. So the idea behind the variables are, yes, fill out your variable model, but make it so that you use only one variable. Fill in verbal model. With variables. But use just one variable. Okay, number six, at this point you're going to solve, and that's great, I'm not sure if it's solved though. You're going to solve, and then you're going to interpret the answer as it relates back to your original problem. You don't do word problems and you go, the answer is six. You go, okay, well, six what? Uh, was that six feet per second? Was that six miles? Was that six pounds? Six hours? It, it depends on what the problem was. So don't just leave it as, as x equals six. You guys are you're in college now, right? I mean, we all know how to write. So write me a sentence. Uh, write me a sen sentence answering the question. So if I was talking about Susie and Johnny, right, uh, I would say Susie's speed was 
10 miles an hour and Johnny's was 15 miles an hour. You, you're going to answer those questions. You know, let's leave it as 10, 10 and 15. So solve and interpret back to the original problem. We're going to do one example here just to illustrate this concept. Uh, next time we'll do several more, uh, but this will just get our, our feet wet. So, example. You stand on top of a building 225 feet tall. Obviously, you want to. Oh, well, that was kind of a psychology <laughs> question, wasn't it? You want to uh, see after class. You want to throw something at the people below. Geez, one of us wants to hurt themselves, and one of us wants to hurt others. <laughs> We're a mess, huh? Joking, joking, joking. At the people below, water balloon, whatever, rocks, you know. Rocks. <laughs> people below. Oh, I mean, uh, uh, so, you throw the, what do you want to throw? Watermelon. A watermelon. <laughs> no, no, no. Watermelon. Watermelon. What happened to Johnny? Johnny got hit with a watermelon in the face. <laughs> <laughs> so, you throw a Watermelon. <laughs> Woo! Okay. I'm growing watermelons right now. Hmm. Big watermelons. If the height is of the object, if the height of the watermelon, you use the watermelons to work out. <laughs> <laughs> you already told me that I need more time in the gym. So, your so to might as well just, uh, honey, I'm gonna go garden. <laughs> if height of the watermelon. is given by the following. For T seconds. How long will it take for the watermelon to hit the people? Because you need to time this, right? Okay. So you get up time. It's going to take where they're going to be after a certain amount of time. So if you want to really throw the watermelon, like you said, you want to crush people's heads with watermelons, so you're sick. Uh, you got to be able to time this right. How long will it take watermelon to hit ground? Hit ground. I'm not going to say hit people because they're like five to six feet above the ground, so I'm going to say hit ground uh, just so we, we're, we're clear. I just said ground. Wow. Yeah, thanks. Okay. That's a long word problem. This is why I don't like word problems. I have to write them. I don't like writing word problems. Doing them easy. <laughs> writing them sucks. I hate writing them. Okay, number one. Read the question carefully. Don't try to solve it right after that. Just get an idea about what's going on. Uh, so, you're on a building. How high is the building? You throw something off it. So get a picture of that. You're throwing off a watermelon in this case. The watermelon is going to climb. No. The watermelon is going to it's going to hit the ground eventually. Uh, the, the height of that watermelon is given by a formula. Okay, we see that here. What we're trying to find out is how long it takes. So, first thing, read it carefully, we just did that. Second thing, if you need to, draw a picture. This is one case where you might not need to draw a picture because the picture is not going to be really very relevant for you. And the reason why is because we have a formula. That's what I'm talking about, find a formula. The formula is right here. It's given to you. So if you want to draw a picture, here's you. Watermelon. 
people. No. And then you're going to crush them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you want to throw some of the people low, watermelon, cool. Heights given by this. Here, now, here's what this formula means. And uh, some of you, you, you're used to, you might have seen these formulas before, but with height and time, here's what this says. Uh, you can probably picture why this is the way it is, but you should think about why the formula, don't just take the formula for granted, okay? Think about what's there. H stands for? T stands for? Time. In seconds. What it means is that at zero seconds, Zero seconds. It's at 225 feet. Hey, how tall is the building? That's where the 225 comes from. You're on a 225 foot building. You drop it. Why is it negative? Because the height's going to decrease as the watermelon falls. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Negative 16 actually comes from, um, you ever heard that things decrease at 32 feet per second squared, uh, that they drop that far, or 9.8 meters per second per second? It's acceleration of gravity. That's what that comes from. I can teach it to you in calculus. We actually make that up. Uh, but this is the fact that it's falling. This is the fact that you're standing on a 225 foot building, okay? As long as you know that time is seconds and h is height, this is what we care about. So we have a picture. We don't really need it. We have a formula. So it doesn't matter if the first uh, term is negative? We're going to talk about that in a minute. What I want to know is, are you, are you okay with the idea of the formula right now? Don't just take it for granted. And try to think about what's going on here, okay? Try. After that, verbal model, we don't really need it. Why not? We have a formula that's kind of nice. Now we're going to start filling out this formula. So let's think about the formula. Think about what the question's asking you. We want to, how long will it take? We want to solve for t when it hits the ground. Uh, eight, I'm sorry, h stands for what? Okay, so when it hits the ground, this idea is, what is t when the height is ground? How high is the ground? Zero. Ah. So if the height is zero, if the height is zero, if the height is zero, could you solve for t? Yeah. Think of what this is doing, ladies and gentlemen. This says, if your height is zero, that's when the watermelon hits the ground. Do you notice that t is a time? Mm -hmm. This is going to give you the time when it's zero, the time when it hits the ground. If you think about the formula, then that makes sense, if you really think through the problem. Now, can you solve something like that? Yes. Holy cow, this is everything we've just done. Uh, what's your first step? Subtract 225. You can do that. Or add 16. You can do that. Take out negative one. Take out negative one. Is everything to one side? Yes. Is it a quadratic? Yes. How about that? Is the first term positive? No. Factor the negative. So if you factor the negative out, we get zero equals negative 16t squared minus 225. Do you stop there? No. Can you continue with that problem? Yes. Hey, what is that problem? Difference of squares. Do you see the difference of squares? It's, I mean, it's almost... Since we've practiced so long, this is not the hard part. The solving is the easy part. Okay, getting this far is the hard part. So zero equals negative. I got to do it faster than out of time. Uh, it'll be four t minus twenty five minus fifteen, mm -hmm. and four t plus fifteen. Can you verify that for me? Four t. That's going to give me my sixteen t squared. And that's 15, 14 minus 15 and plus 15. Uh, do I stop there? Okay, you, you all, all got to tell me at this point. Uh, check this on your own, okay? Verify that this is true. I know it's right, um, but you got to verify that for me. It's 4t minus 15, 4t plus 15. Can you do that on your own? Yeah. Okay, after that, how many factors include variables? Two. And we have a zero. And as a product. One of these, t is going to equal 15 over 4. The other one, t is going to equal negative 15 over 4. Now let me ask you a question here, okay, before, you, before you go. When you throw watermelons off of buildings, and naturally you've done this many times, so you know this. When you throw watermelons off of buildings, do you go back in time? Because that would be awesome, but do you go back in time? No. So when you get these solutions, if one of them is negative, there's a chance that you could get this false solution. 
And when we're talking about time, there's no such thing as negative time. What's our correct solution? 15 over 4 what, ladies and gentlemen? 3 and 3 quarters seconds. So you're going to drop this. It's going to be 15 over 4 seconds. So the way you end this problem, I'm not going to do it here. It's on your own. After 3 and 3 fourths, or after 15 fourths seconds, the watermelon will hit the ground. That's it. All right, we're going to continue our practice of our word problems. Now, I gave you some steps on how to do this. And what I told you is that some of these steps are going to be relevant, and some aren't. Uh, frankly, it's just an outline about how you should go about thinking about solving some word problems. So, the first one, of course, we got to read our questions carefully. So, the one I have on the board, not a whole lot to this. I just wanted to give you uh, an idea behind it. Second one, after you read it carefully, next thing we're going to try to do is what? What did what I tell you? That's right. Draw, if, draw it's, if applicable, draw a picture. Now, when you get something like this, you're not going to draw a square and a minus sign. That's not, that's not the idea. So sometimes drawing a picture really doesn't, doesn't do much for us. After that, you look for a formula. Sometimes these things go together. Sometimes you'll have a picture and a formula. Sometimes you won't have either. Uh, after that, after you read it carefully, after you've drawn a picture if you can, after you've found a formula if you can, next thing we're going to do is try to come up with a verbal model. That's what this one is. This is just a verbal model. So when we get a problem that doesn't really have a picture or a formula associated with it, it's probably a verbal model already. Uh, in that case, we just need to translate it and be very good at it. So there's a couple words that we need to know. The first one is anywhere that you see the word is or was or equals, that stands for an equation. So when we read this, the square of a number minus twice the number is 63. First thing we're looking for is anything that means equals. Because what that does, that separates our verbal model for us automatically. What it says is anything before the word is, is on the left hand side. Anything after the word is, is on the right hand side. It sets up an equation for us and that's nice. After that we start word looking for any words that mean math. Give me a word up here that means math. Square. square. What's a square mean? I don't, I'm not talking about a shape because it's already a verbal model. What's a square mean? It is an exponent. Exponent of what? A number. One, two, three, exponent of two. two. So this right here, when we say square of, we mean power two. So we're, we're breaking down this word problem by translating it. Uh, what else? What, how about a number? What's a number mean? A variable. Uh, not necessarily an exponent, because that's what the square means. It's a power of, so a square of power two of... This next thing, it's a, it's a relator. It says of something, of this variable. A number is always standing for something that you don't know. So it can be x, y, I don't care what it is. As long as you have a variable, they all use x because we're used to it. So when, I, when I'm talking about the square of a number, the square of whatever, we're talking about whatever that is, this qualifies as it's based on this next thing. So the square of, okay, what do I have? x, now the square of that power 2 on top of the x. So it's going to relate it to your next thing. After that, uh, what else up here means some math? Minus. What's minus mean? It means minus, of course. Uh, now, twice, let's focus on twice last, okay? What is the number? A number. Is it the same number, same variable or a different variable? Same variable. It's the same one. Remember how I told you in equations you can have at most one variable right now? So you can't do x here and then y here. In fact, it says the number. It says relating back to what you already chose, give me that same variable. Whatever you chose, it does not matter. Now, the word twice, it's a weird word. All right? Twice always means two times. So I could have said two different ways. I could have said the square of a number minus two times a number, or if I wanted to make it a little shorter, twice means two times. So this means two times. And then 63 is 63. As soon as we've translated each little piece, we can go ahead and make up our equation from that. So let's see how it would start. It says the square, oh, okay, power two of what? A number, x. So what's the first thing I'm gonna write? Okay. That's right. By the way, uh, everything in, in these math verbal models is always in order, unless you see the words from or than. That will switch around. So in this case, the square of a number minus twice a number, it should be written all in order. So the square of a number, cool, x squared, minus, minus, two times, twice the number. How am I going to write that? 
and then what? Cool. Is separates it and then 63. Have we seen stuff like that before? Yeah. As soon as you translate it from here to here, it becomes easy at this point. Now, tell me what this is. It's a quadratic equation. What do we do with quadratic equations? Cool. Can we factor right now? Is that a good idea? No. What is the magic number that you have to have? On one side of the equation, you have to have a zero because of what property? Or what is that? Zero. That's right. We've got to listen. If you got a quadratic or higher, you will be factoring. And if you're factoring, your magic number is zero because we're going to set every factor equal to zero. So this doesn't work for us. Um, I'm going to keep this positive by moving the 63, subtracting on both sides, and getting x squared minus 2x minus 63 is zero. At this point, yeah, we're going to factor. You know what? I'm going to keep it really quick for you. This is not the point anymore for me to teach you factoring. The point is getting from here to here and then understanding what to do. If it's a quadratic, everything in order, one side, first term positive. We said it so many times. Oh, my gosh, it should be like burned in your memory. Uh, then we're going to factor. Factoring, it's a diamond problem with a shortcut. What are they? Nine. I'm going to go nine. That's right. So we have x minus 9, x plus 7. We definitely check our work before we get any further, but we're going to be right here. And then we keep going. Okay, well, we have two factors. Each one of them could equal 0 and be an answer to the solution, or answer to this equation. So x equals positive 9, x equals negative 7, and we get our two answers. Well, it's positive, right? You get a negative x equals above the x equals 9. Right above that, you get a negative x so equals positive 9. This one? Below it? Why would that? That's the same thing. So we have the same factors, and then we go ahead and we solve them. Now, I'd like to move on just a little bit. We're going to go into just some kind of like hardcore word problems and see if we can we can match them. This would be kind of this would be considered one of the really easy ones because someone's already made a verbal model for you. What I'm going to do now, I'm giving you two introductory problems. We're going to go through and kind of make them a little harder, and then I'll show you a couple other uh, concepts I want you to be aware of. Are you guys ready for it? Okay. That was not convincing. Are you ready for it? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Just to convince the people watching that there are people in this class that I'm not just crazy talking to walls. All right. He's crazy. You ever seen the movie Frozen? Mm -hmm. I used to like that movie. Okay. So here we go. These are the ones that just kill students because they just don't want to think about them and have a hard time setting them up. The length of a rectangle is 5 feet more than the width. The area is 176 square feet. What we want, find the dimensions, find the length and the width. So, let's talk about it. Hey, what's your first step? What should we do automatically whenever we get a word problem? Find that. Read it. Yeah, read it. Read it real careful. So, uh, the length of a rectangle is five feet more than the width. Okay. The area is 176 square feet. Find the length and the width. When we're when we're reading it, we're kind of thinking about what we have. Do we have a shape here? What shape do we have? Can we draw a picture of a rectangle? And would it be relevant? Probably. Yeah, a picture might be a real good thing to have here because it's going to organize our thoughts a little bit better. So if we have a rectangle, it doesn't matter how you draw your rectangle as long as you draw a rectangle. So step number two, draw a picture. Yeah, it's probably pretty relevant in this, in this case. Uh, now, let's see. Verbal model? Well, we're, we're not at that point. In fact, we probably are going to have a formula up here if we think about this for a second. The length of a rectangle is five feet more than the width. Let's get that done, and then let's consider the next sentence. The length of a rectangle is five feet 
more than the width. Width is more than plus. Has this idea of addition. That's right. So whatever my width is, my length is five feet more than that. Does that make sense? Now I gave you a, a very good piece of advice. I said that when you're making up your pictures or your equations, you have to use the same variable. So you can't use x's and y's or l's and w's. You got to use the same thing, which is why they give you these reference tools and they say, you know what? Base your length on the width. So when we, th which one would be our, our width in this case? Does it does it matter? Well. If you read it, it says the length is five feet more than the width. So what's what's going to be the bigger one, the length or the width? Did you catch that? I'll say it one more time. Some of you guys, what are you talking about? Length and width. Uh, if the length is five feet more than the width, the longest dimension here has to be the length in this case. So this is length. So we, we could write that. It's kind of like taking your verbal model and changing it into your picture. So this is your length, and this is your width. Now, it says the length, length, there you go, and find, find the length, find the length right there. <laughs> okay. Length, what up, G? Oh, God. That was good, come on. <laughs> so dorky. Okay, length and width. We know the length has to be the bigger one because it says it's more than the width. Now, come up with a variable. It doesn't matter which one you call the variable. It does not matter. You just have to get them in the right order. So, uh, what variable do you want to use? I don't care. How about... Uh, oh, Q. Q? Okay, that's fine. Whatever. Q. Here's the deal. If you call the width Q, how much is the length? Q plus 5. That's right. The more than puts it after, so it's not 5 plus Q. It's Q plus 5. Now, if you wanted to do it different, you could. If you called the length Q, the length has to be 5 feet more than the width. You could set it up like that. It's the same thing. It will work out the same. Does that make sense to you? Now, personally, I like to put the one that's referencing, the, the dimension that's referencing as the variable. So it says, if length of rectangle is 5 feet more than the width, it's saying the length is based on the width. Let's call the Q for our width, and then our Q plus 5 for our length. It's referencing the width then. The more than means it's, it's plus. So it means be okay with that one. So that's our picture. Okay, not bad. Uh, what else is it telling us in the second sentence? That's important to know. So area is 176 square feet. Now, we got a picture. Do we have a formula that relates our picture of a rectangle to an area idea of 176 square feet? Do we have a formula, basically, of area of a rectangle? Mm -hmm. That's right. So here's what, we're, here's what we do. We make our picture, if, if it's applicable, it certainly is here. It's a, bless you twice. It's a rectangle. We know that our length is five feet more than our width. We know that area is 176 square feet. We also know that area of a rectangle is length times width. We know that. Now, this right here is your formula, true? We write our formula first, and then what I showed you in the very first example um, last time that we did this, we start filling out our formula with variables that are appropriate from our picture, variables appropriate to the problem, and any numbers that we have. So, do we have an expression for the length? What is it? Q plus 5. So here we have Q plus 5. Do we have an expression for the width? Would it be a good idea if I put this? Q plus 5 times Q. Does that make sense? This whole idea of length the whole thing here is our length. Now, next question. Do we know how much the area actually is? How much is it? <coughs> by creating, and this, this may be a simple example, but by creating the, the picture, it lets us organize our thoughts. It lets us put down variables and relate them to each other. By thinking about, well, its area of a rectangle, it gives us a formula. 
after you have a picture, that formula is pretty easy to fill in. We have a length, q plus 5. We've got a width, q. Multiplying is the idea of getting area of a rectangle, and we know the area is 176. I want to know if you can follow this. Show of hands if you can. If you're okay with it. Yes, no? Are we done? No, no. What are we going to do? Why? We need zero. Is that a zero? If that's not zero, you've got to undo some factoring here. So what I want you to do is solve the problem at this point. This should be really easy. I mean, if I gave this to you on a test, I'd expect 100% by everybody. So go ahead and solve this. Go for it. Okay, let's solve our problem here. Uh, did you all recognize that when you try to do the zero product property, you got to have a zero? So if you don't have a, a zero, we're trying to get everything on one side, and you're going to have to distribute. Did you all distribute? You guys alive today? Yeah. All right, I hope that you did. I hope that you distributed. So 176 is Q squared. Did you get Q squared? Yeah. Plus 5Q? Yeah. Okay, everyone, real quick, you should all know it. What type of equation is this? That's right, quadratic. And with quadratic equations, with power twos or higher, you are going to be factoring. If you're going to be factoring, what's the magic number? Zero. 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 Do I want to move the right step to the left or the left step to the right? Left, 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 left. If I subtract 176 and I put everything in order with first term positive, which is what I want, we get 0 equals q squared plus 5q minus 176. Oh man, diamond problem? 5 and negative 176, so two numbers that are separated by 5 units, they give you 176. Have you thought of them? 16 and negative 11. 16 and negative 11. Can you double check it? Have you double checked it? So 16 and negative 11. Let's double check. Does that add to positive 5? Yeah. Does that multiply to negative 176? That's great. Thankfully, it's a shortcut too. We can just set this equal to our two factors. Q plus 16, Q minus 11. Hey, uh, are we done? No. <clears throat> what now? So Q plus 16 is 0. We got Q minus 11 is 0. Therefore, Q equals negative 16, and Q equals positive 11. I want to show hands if you're okay with the math. You might not have found those numbers. That, that was kind of difficult. Um, I, want, I want to answer two, th two things. Firstly, are you okay with the picture and converting the formula? And secondly, the idea of solving a quadratic. Show of hands if you are. The numbers might take you some time. That's true, okay? Now, are you okay with both of those solutions? No. Explain to me why some of you are shaking your head no. What's wrong? We have to plug them in. Okay, we do got to plug them in. Um, secondly, what does Q stand for in our case? Does Q stand for the length or the width? 
You ever have a rectangle with a length of or width of negative 16 feet? No. Mm. Can distances be negative? Can lengths and widths be negative? No. So do you remember how last time we got negative time for dropping something? Remember how, how you crazy people dropping watermelons off of buildings? Sickos. And you went back in time? You can't go back in time. You also can't have negative distances on actual shapes. So in this case, yeah, negative 16, not so much. Does that make sense to you? So in our case, here's how we answer the question. You do not just leave it like this. That is not appropriate. What you do do is, did you catch that? That's funny. Um, what you do do is you, you write a sentence stating what has just happened. So you would say something like, um, the dimensions of, the, of this rectangle our width is 11 feet, our length is, and then you tell me what the length is. By the way, if our width is 11, how much is our length? 16. Yeah, you just add 5 to it because that's where it comes from. Does that make sense to you? So we'd say something like that. Width would be 11 feet and length. Because it says, hey, length is 5 feet more than width, that's where we got this whole thing from, would be 16 feet. <clears throat> Curious if this will make sense to you. Show of hands if it does. You feel right with it. Okay, now we're going to do this kind of together, but I want mostly your help on it. So, uh, by the way, real problem. Um, I used to sail, uh, race Victory 21s, and your sails have to be certain dimensions for some categories of boats. So, let's say that this is the category, and this is a made up problem because that, that number right there is a little wrong for some, some boats, but let's say I need a sail for my racing boat and it's got to fit the following conditions. Firstly, it's got to be triangular because sails are usually triangular, uh, especially for like the, the main sail. There's a jib, main sail, and um, a spinnaker it just, if you're in spinning glass. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's say I'm making a, a, a main sail and so I'm going to have this triangle and this triangle, the base must be one foot less than three times the height and the area is it's got to be a maximum of this area. Uh, but you can't just make a huge sail all that, that, uh, that fits your boat. Sometimes there's, there's categories you go, yeah, I have a sail with less than this amount of square inches, square feet. So in this case, square feet. Uh, would a picture be appropriate? Yeah. Probably. So step one, let's draw a triangle. Now, main sails aren't really this type of isosceles triangle. They're typically right triangles, but it doesn't really matter. So we got a triangle. Let's read about the base and the height. Which, how, would I, how would I determine the height here? What's the height? Is this the height? No. no. What's the height do? Straight up. So the height goes like this, height. The base would be this whole thing here. What I need to do is somehow relate the height and the base using the same variable so that I can make a formula or make an equation up with these, these ideas. So uh, let's see. What is related on, off of what? Is the height related off of the base or is the base related off of the height? What do you think? Base. Read, it carefully, read it carefully, okay? It says, the base must be one foot less than the height. It's relating one to the other. It's saying something has to be rooted in the other one. What's happening here? Is the base being related to the height, off of the height, or is the height being related to the base? Do you understand the question? Say what now? The base is off the height. The base is off the height. It says, the base must be blah, 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 then the height. Okay, so the height is the thing I want a variable for. What variable do you want to use for the height? T. Okay, I like T. T for the height. You see, because the base is based on the height, we can now make an expression for our base that's related to that T. So let's do it. The base must be one foot less than three times the height. Do you guys notice that this is like the same wording for our first problem today? Very similar. What's less than mean? Minus. minus, but it's not one minus, it's reverse because it has that word than in it. If you watch my crowdsman videos, you would know that, uh, or you have had me for class, from and than, the words from and than switch things around. So the way you want it to be switches it from from and than. So the base must be one foot less than, whatever you're going to have, 
guarantee you're going to have a minus 1 at the end. That, less, that 1 less than means something, 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 minus 1. Now, 3 times the height. How can I represent 3 times the height? 3 That's why we call it t first, so we can base it on that. So you go, okay, the height is t, therefore the base can be rooted in the height, based on the height. So here's t, we want base is 1 foot less than 3 times the height. Show of hands if you're okay with, with that one. Now, next thing. Area must be 210 square feet. That's important to know, but it's also important to know that, well, is there a formula that's going to relate the area of 210 square feet to an idea of a triangle? Is there a formula for the area of a triangle, in other words? Do you know what it is? Mm, that's rectangle. If you don't, it's okay, I'll give it to you. Area of a triangle is one half base times height or base times height divided by 2 is the same thing. Now, that'll be given to you, okay? You'll have the formula. What I want to know is, can you take these pieces and put it in these pieces and put it into this formula? Can you do that? Okay, why not? Do you know what the area is? One half doesn't change. Do you know what the base is? Hello, do you know what the base is? Do you know what the height is? Fill it in. Do it. Go for it. Okay, let's see how much we can get done here. Uh, oh. Do we have an expression for the actual area of this triangle? That's what it says, it's 210, okay. Equals, does a one half change? That's part of the formula. Times, do we have an expression for the base of our triangle? T minus one half one. Do we have an expression for the height of our triangle? Have I done this appropriately? That looks good to you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because anytime we have an expression with more than one term, you've got to group it. You've got to say this is, this is your one expression. Your base, your base isn't 3t, and then, and then you multiply. Well, this would multiply the 1 times a t and the 1 half times 3t, and we can't let that happen. We've got to have this group together. So let's see, 1 half, 1 half, base, 3t minus 1, in parentheses, times the height of t. Show of hands if you're okay with, with that one. At this point, we should be pretty good to go. Pretty good to go. Um, draw a picture, right? Filled out all this stuff. We had a formula. Filled out all the formula. That's just a simple math problem. Now, if you're like, there's a fraction. It's not simple. Not simple, you liar. <laughs> uh, look it. Getting rid of fractions is super easy in equations. In fact, I'm going to show you how to do this in uh, section 7.5. But I'll give you a little, little preview. Uh, what's the denominator? Three. Multiply by 2. If you multiply on both sides of the equation by 2. Multiply by 2. Multiply by 2. These 2's are gone. You've just gotten rid of the fraction. Don't distribute a fraction in an equation. That's freaking crazy, okay? Get rid of the fraction. Did you understand that? Get rid of the fraction. Trying to do uh, factoring with... Factoring with fractions? Not so bueno, okay? <laughs> that sucks. So don't do that. Get rid of the fraction, multiply both sides of your equation by your denominator, and you automatically got it. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's multiply it. What's on the left-hand side? What do we got? 420. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> We're not in Washington. Uh, and then here, if we distribute this, this is 3t squared minus t. I gave you some nasty numbers today, didn't I? Yeah. I want to see if we're okay so far. Uh, number one, are you okay with the formula being translated to here before doing any math? Head on if you are. Are you okay with that one? I don't want to lose you guys today if I'm not getting much out of you. Are you okay or not? You sure? Are you okay with getting rid of the one half by multiplying by two on both sides? Yeah. So if I multiply both sides by two, one half times two, gone. Don't forget over here, that becomes 420. This one, we distribute. Then we get 3t squared minus t. 
Look at the board right there. What type of equation is that? Quadratic. What do you do with quadratic equations? Do it. Let's do it. Would you move the right stuff to the left or the left stuff to the right? Left to the right. So 0 equals 3t squared minus t minus 420. Oh my gosh, what are we going to Just right side, you guys. What now? Is this a shortcut down problem? No. Oh, dang it. Oh. So we would have what number up top? One. Negative one. Oh, negative one. And then? Nope. Oh, negative. Yep. Negative. I don't know if I can do that in my head. But I'll give you some hints. Do you know the signs are different? Mm -hmm. Yes, no. Yeah. No? Yeah. You don't know the signs are different? Yeah. You do know the signs are different. The signs are going to be different. One's got to be positive, one's got to be negative. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Also, if the signs are different and you're adding a negative one, these numbers are separated by only one spot. So they're consecutive. They're like 24, 25, or like 36, 37. So, uh, I don't know if this is going to work. I'm just thinking on top of my head. Can you take the square root of 1260? Wasn't rhetorical. Take 1260, take the square root. 35, Why don't you try 35 and 36 and tell me what that is? 35 times 36. Oh, how about that? So if I took negative 36 and positive 35, since they're separated by one, that's, that's why I did that. Took a square root because they're going to be really close, okay? And then work it out like that. That's an idea. Does that add to negative one? Multiplies to that one. It's kind of nasty, but hey, it'll work. So zero equals, and now we factor by grouping. I shouldn't really have to explain to you how do we do that anymore because we should pros at it. If we do 3t factors out of this, 12, 20, 30, 30, looks like it's 12. What factors out of 35? It's 35 and 36 again, right? Four twenty divided by 35? So if I factor out 35, I know 5 goes into it because of here. I also know that 7 goes into it because of here. Uh, so it's got to be the 35. If we factor that, we got t minus 12, and we got 3t plus 35. That's some nasty factoring. I get it. The numbers are really big. Okay, So on your own, it might take you some time to do this. Here's my question. Are you okay getting down to at least this far? Yes, no. Yes. You should be here. Do you understand the idea of how to do that? Yeah. But the numbers are big. Okay, they, they can be difficult. At this point, well, we're almost done. Use the zero product problem. That's why we got the zero in the first place. Set both of these guys equal, both your factors equal to zero. If I subtract 35 and divide by 3, t equals 35 over 3, but it's negative. Here, if I add 12, t is 12. Now tell me, in relationship to our problem, can you have a sale with a height of negative 35 over 3 feet? Does that make sense? No. no. So what's the height of our sale that I need? 12. 12 what? Feet. Good. So when we write this, we go, okay, our height is 12 feet. How I know it's the height is because I look back at my pictures. Why do we have a picture? Uh, the height was t. So my height is 12 feet. And then, uh, what's my base? How did you get that? Yeah, sure, plug it in. If I want to take my, how much is my t again? So 3 times 12 minus 1 gives us a base of 35. I hope you weren't completely just zoned out when we went through this. Um, this would be a good example for you to know for a test. Hint? Hint.
Hint. Hint. You're going to have to do this on a test. Uh, the whole idea of factory is absolutely useless unless you can use it. This is how you use this stuff. It's actually in real life math that stuff happens like this. Uh, I want to know if I've explained well enough that I, I don't, I cannot give you an example of every word problem you're going to have. That is impossible. I want to know if you understand how the outline of the steps I gave you can work for you. Do you guys get the idea of that? Okay. Now the last two, I'm going to give you some, some concept ideas. Uh, last two things we're going to talk about. The first one is something called Pythagorean theorem. Have you ever heard of Pythagorean theorem before? Yeah. Sounds kind of weird, but if you know a squared plus b squared equals c squared, I kind of want you to forget that. Uh, because it doesn't tell you the relationship amongst the sides of the triangle that I want you to know. So with Pythagorean theorem, Firstly, can you say Pythagorean? Say Pythagorean. Pythagorean. Yeah, part of this class, part of any math class is saying stuff right because you don't want to sound like an idiot, all right? Uh, it's the uh, Pythagorean theorem. No. You don't want to emphasize the wrong syllable, okay? It's Pythagorean. Say it. Pi. Pi. Fag. Great word. Or. Ian, like the name Ian. Pythagorean. Theorem. Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem. Here's what the Pythagorean theorem is in reference to. It's in reference to the shape called a right triangle. A right triangle, as opposed to a wrong triangle, a uh, 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 right triangle simply means it's a triangle with one 90 degree angle signified by this little box here. If you think about it, you can have at most one 90 degree angle in a triangle. Because if you had more than one, you'd have a box. If it was three sided, you'd have an open box. Uh, so you can have only one. Now, these different sides in a right triangle, they have names. Down here, by the way, you have to forgive my triangle, I'm not the best artist. Down here, we call this a leg, and this a leg. Hey, you have two legs, this has two legs. But you don't have this third thing. The longest side of a right triangle. The side that if you put your, your pencil on this 90 degree angle and draw a straight line, it will cross this other side. Not this. Uh, huh? <laughs> no. Not this. Uh, those aren't straight. So if you draw a straight line from here, it will intersect the side that's called the hypotenuse. Can you say hypotenuse? <laughs> Hypotenuse is a weird word. Hypotenuse? High? Because you just smoked some. I'm joking. <laughs> joking. <laughs> Did you catch that? Yeah. <laughs> We're not in Colorado either. Uh, high? <laughs> pot? <laughs> and? <laughs> oos. <laughs> Hypotenuse. <laughs> yeah. Longest side of a right triangle, you can always find it. I'm, I'm going to get so fired, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> Joe, don't smoke weed. It's really bad. <laughs> That's okay. It helps you learn that. Not the, not the weed, I mean that. <laughs> Jokes. Hypotenuse. Now, the Pythagorean theorem has a relationship amongst these three sides, which is pretty impressive. Uh, I know that, that you've seen it before, most of you, probably, uh, but you probably have never really thought about it. It's really crazy. Uh, here's what it says. It says that if you take the length of a leg, and then you square it, plus the length of another leg, and then you square it, it is equal to the length of the hypotenuse after you square it. Leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. The reason why uh, teachers are now kind of going away from the A, B, and C thing is because A doesn't tell you it's a leg, B doesn't tell you it's a leg, and C doesn't tell you it's a hypotenuse. So students are getting those all messed up. Uh, they say, oh, the first two that I see are, the first numbers are A and B. No, no. Leg, leg, hypotenuse. Put the numbers in the right place and then you can use this Pythagorean theorem. The next idea I have for you is this idea of being consecutive. In fact, I referenced this a little, a little while ago, consecutive. What does consecutive mean? Back to back. back. What's another way to say that? In order. In order, sure. So if I gave you uh, the number four, and I said I want the, the next consecutive number, what would it be? Five. Five. And what would the one after that be? Six. Good. 
And then you go on and on and on. How about if I said the next consecutive even numbers? Could you do it? If I said start off with uh, with 16, what's the next consecutive even number? 18. Good. And then? 20. And then count even numbers. We'll get to that one in a minute. What I want you to know is how to set up this idea of being consecutive in an algebraic expression. Because they're not going to, they're going to say, okay, the sum of two consecutive numbers is blah. You can't start with 4, you can't start with 16, you've got to know how to set that up. Here's how to set up any time you see the words consecutive, or consecutive even, or odd, adjust accordingly. Here's how to set that up. Call your starting spot x. So as an algebraic expression, This would be where you start. So, if I want consecutive numbers and I have to give myself some variables for it, you got to start somewhere. Start at your x. Now, the next number. Do you remember me telling you this? You remember? I know you remember. Uh, you remember how we can only use one variable? Remember that? One variable. You can't go to y. You got it based on the x. So if I start at x, the next consecutive number would be how many past x? Six. One more past x. One more past x. This is one more. So this is where you start. This is like one after your start. Wherever you start, that's one after that. Does that make sense to you? What's the next one? X plus two. It actually be x plus one plus one. X plus two. It'd just be one more. X plus two. It'd be okay, here's one more, here's two more. What would the next one be? X plus three. Yeah, and so forth. But in this way you can relate it back to one variable, and that's really important for us. Should fans feel okay with, with this idea? So X is your start. Where have you started? It doesn't matter. Uh, then, then look at what you're doing. If you're talking about consecutive integers, the next integer should be x plus one. So that's going to be x plus 2. It's always going to relate back to where you start. Now, I told you I would tell you in just a minute. Now that minute is up. Let's talk about consecutive even. I gave you 16. What's the next even number after that? And then after that? How much are those numbers separated by? Two. Well, with consecutive even, I still have to have a place to start. But what would the next consecutive even number look like in terms of x? How far away from x would it have to be? Because plus 1 is going to give me odd. All right, I want another one. I want the plus 2. So the next one would be x plus 2. How about the one after that? What do you think? X plus, plus, plus 4. four. Yeah. And then so forth and so on. Here's an interesting note. Would consecutive odd numbers be different? No. no. Are they still separated by two spots? Yes. No. So if I had... 17, then 19, then 21, it would still be x, x plus 2, and x plus 4. Do you see what I'm talking about? That's interesting. Um, the way you set up the problem is exactly the same. It's just that your what it's equaling will be different if it's consecutive even versus consecutive odd. Uh, so, for instance, you know what, I don't have really a whole lot of time to give you this. Um, I'm going to do two examples for you. Fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set these things up for you. I'm not going to do them. I'm just going to set them up because we're, we're frankly out of time. So I'm going to set them up and leave them to you to do them from basically the, the algebra on, on out. So let's say I, I have, I have to do this. Find two consecutive odd integers. whose product is 23 more than their sum.
What? Find two consecutive odd integers whose product is 23 more than their sum. We're going to go very quickly through. I'll show you the setup. Do you notice how a lot of the words up here we've used before? Like the word is. What's is mean? What's product mean? What's more than mean? And it's more than, reversed. What's sum mean? Again, adding. Okay. Two consecutive integers. Do we know how to do that? Okay, give me give me two consecutive I'm sorry, two consecutive odd integers. Oh, two consecutive odd integers. Give me two consecutive odd integers. Make sure the first one starts with X. What's the next one? Would you agree these are two consecutive odd integers? Yes. Okay, now check this out. Find two consecutive odd integers whose product is product equals. Here's two consecutive integers. If I make them a product, here's two consecutive integers and you have a product. Do you guys see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Is equals 23 more than, you know what, it's going to be whatever I have plus 23. 23 more than something, okay, then add 23. There's sum. Oh, hey, here's two consecutive odd integers. Can I make the sum out of these guys? Have I lost you? Do you understand these are consecutive odd integers? First one says two of them. Consecutive odd. Product. Oh, okay. Multiplying. Get it? Is equals okay. 23 more than more than the very end. Their sum. Can you add these guys together? Let's see if it makes sense. Are these two consecutive odd integers? Is it a product of those? Okay. Is this two consecutive odd integers? Is it a sum of those? And then 23 more than that. That's the way you set it up. Now let's, let's think about the first couple steps here. What would you do? Distribute. You distribute. Would you distribute this? No. No. That's a plus. So you get x squared plus 2x. You get 2x plus 2 plus 23. Verify 2x plus 2 plus 23. Can you see that? What type of equation do you have here? Quadratic. Quadratic equation. What are you going to do with that quadratic equation? Everything to one side and factor it. That's what you would do. It's going to give you your starting number. It's going to give you the, the you can find the next one, the consecutive odd integer. Um, by the way, if this word had been even, please listen carefully. If this word had been even, all of this would be exactly the same. The only problem this would work out. That would have to be an even number for that to happen. Okay, last example, then we're going to stop. So, wait for just a second. Here. What if I told you that in a certain right triangle, the sides were consecutive integers, consecutive even integers? In a right triangle, sides are consecutive even integers. And I want you to find a length. In a right triangle, okay, we get a right triangle. Sides are consecutive, even integers. Uh, in a certain, sorry, certain. It's not for all of them. I don't know if you care about that, but I'll write it anyway. Hey, uh, how many sides are there? Three. Can I write three consecutive even integers like this? What would the smallest one be here? Would it be this one? No. So would I want to start x here and then go x plus 2, x plus 4? No. Probably not. Probably start with the smallest one. Let's make this our x. Okay, 
Do you understand that with consecutive even, it's going to be x and then x plus 2 and then x plus 4? We already did that. Mm -hmm. Where is the x plus 2 going to go? Hypotenuse or other leg? Other, other leg. leg. Meaning the longest one has to be the hypotenuse. I'm sure fans feel okay with, with that. Now, we're not going to finish it, probably for obvious reasons, because this is going to take a while. I want the setup, though. If you set this up with Pythagorean theorem, give me one of the legs, please. X. And square. Plus, give me another leg, please. X plus two. And the whole thing squared. Equal? Four. Oh, not four X. X plus four. Square. Square. Oh, my gosh. What's going to happen? You distribute this, distribute this, it's a quadratic. Everything goes to one side, and you factor. I know that we didn't finish it, but are you okay with the setup on that thing? Yeah. Okay.